You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hello, and welcome to the heart of Fiat Crucified Love. This week, we are going to talk about reparation. What is reparation, right? And there's different ways that we can look at this. The Lord calls, um, the Lord lived reparation for our sins. That's why we're not going to go to hell if we accept his gift of redemption. He made up for our sins on the cross. But he calls us as part of his body to partake in that. And part of that is making up for our sins with our own act of our will right? When you go to confession, you're given a penance to make up for what you've done. And the catechism teaches that if you've wronged someone, not only are you supposed to go to confession, you have a moral obligation to make it up to them in some way. If you've stolen goods to try to, um, you know, get them back to them. And if it specifically talks about if you've ruined someone's reputation, if you've spoken falsely or without proper knowledge and ruined their reputation, you have a moral obligation to go back and to make up the truth. But we also are called to do penance or to live reparation for the sins of others the way that Christ lived for us because we're part of his body. So we're gonna talk about all of that this week. It's a lot to cover. And when the Lord gave me the topic, I was a bit um, intimidated, but I think we've pulled something together. So let's start with a prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit, live, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we will be recreated and that will renew the face of the earth. my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all and all. Seeking you as a precious jewel, Lord, to give up I be a
name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's so hard not to say Alleluia during Lent. <laughs> I'm used to inserting that everywhere, but I'll try. <laughs> So reparation, I have a couple different things here I've pulled out that I want to touch upon. And I think we'll have a beautiful podcast together. I decided to sit by Jesus on the cross because that's where he won um, reparation for our sins, right? And he won heaven for us as Jesus, the eternal high priest, the altar, the victim, and the priest. And Our Lady, you can see in this icon, her her mystery of co-redemption. And here you see that even as a child, Jesus is making that offering. He's innocent and he's pure, but his heart and his hands are pierced and the blood is falling into the chalice. And that chalice we will receive and it will be our salvation. So it's so beautiful. So what is reparation, right? What is reparation? Reparation comes from the Latin word reparare, meaning to make ready again. So when we make reparation to God, we're making our souls ready to receive his grace, right? And that's what Jesus did in his reparation, right? He made us ready to receive that grace of God again. Because when we sin, we put up a block to that grace of God. So it's like, you know, sin rips the relationship of man and God. And reparation mends that. Jesus did it ultimately on the cross, but we as part of his body are able to do it as well. Um, you know, making up to him for our sins and then also making up for the sins of others. It's really incredible. And, you know, the Catechism of the Catholic Church um, defines reparation. I'm going to read it just because it's always good to go to the source, right? As making amends for a wrong done or for an offense, especially for sin, which is an offense against God. So by his death on the cross, Jesus, the Son of God, offered his life out of love for the Father to make reparation for our sinful disobedience. We are obliged to make reparation for personal sins against justice and truth. Right, And that, I mentioned that at the beginning, either through the restoration of stolen goods or correcting the harm done to another's good reputation or name, right? But we're also called to make up to Christ for um, the wounds that we inflicted upon him through our sin. You know, he took, when you see Jesus bloody on the cross, that's our sins that we see. And we have to make up to him for hurting him. It's like, say you, you say something, you know, you're having a bad day and somebody does something and you say something really mean to them or you do something really mean to them. It's like punching them in the stomach or knocking them down on the ground. You can't just say like, oops, sorry. No, go over there, extend your hand, help them up, wipe the dirt off. You know, even if it was an accident, it's your obligation to do that. Find out if they're hurt, listen to them, and try to heal. Now, we're called to be instruments of healing to everyone, but especially if we're the ones who hurt them, right? You want to repair the damage that you've done to another's heart. The human heart is, um, is very fragile, and, and um, it's a treasure. And, you know, what did Jesus say in scripture? Better for a millstone to be put around your neck and you thrown into the sea than to hurt one of my little ones, to lead one of my little ones astray. So it's, it's a huge responsibility to receive that gift of salvation, of Jesus' reparation for our sins, that we're baptized into that. Because then we have an obligation to do that to others. So not only not to hurt them, 
but when they're hurt, to try to make that up, especially if it was our responsibility, right? It's less of an obligation if, you know, your brother hurts somebody. It's still good to go and try to fix whatever your brother did. But if you're the one that did it, then you have an obligation to reach out and say, you know what? I punched you in the face. Are you okay? I'm sorry, right? And we have an obligation to do that to Jesus because literally we can see how we punch him in the face through our sins. It is my and your sin of pride that put those thorns in his head. And I'm going to read a little bit of his words on that here in a bit. So we are called to partake in this reparation and making up. And redemptive suffering is our suffering that we unite with his suffering on the cross for that purpose, right? And as a baptized Christian, we're all called to partake in some way You know, we're baptized as priest, prophet, and king. What is priest? To be a priest, a victim, and an altar. As St. Paul says, to make up what's lacking in the suffering of Christ. Well, what could be lacking? Our participation. If we're part of his body. And so we're called to be a victim in a way. Now, there are saints who were called to be victim souls, which means that they like literally suffered the passion, right? Padre Pio had the wounds of Christ. Or they're called to give up all work in the world and family life and parish life, right? And really just to live crucified on a bed, imitating those three hours of Christ. That's an extreme vocation of being a victim soul. It happens, but rarely. But we are all called, priests are called in a special way to be a victim, right? And we've talked about that before where the catechism says like priests absolve sins, but they're called to do penance and to pray for those that they forgive. They're going to suffer for those that they're called to help, right? And the more they're called to help them, the more they're going to suffer for them. But we're all baptized as priests in a little way. And I go into that a lot more actually in this new book that I have coming out very soon about the priesthood and Our Lady and how we can pray for priests and and enter into that relationship between Our Lady and Jesus, the eternal high priest. But, you know, in Lumen Gentium, it talks about that, how we, the baptized, are all called to a priestly vocation of offering worship and offering redemptive suffering. That's reparation, right? Imagine this, you're at home and your little sister goes somewhere and people are really mean to her. And she comes home and she's crying. You know, if you go and you throw your arms around her and you say, it's okay, you know, look at this. I love you. Do you want to go, you know, do this with me? Or do you want to go out to dinner tonight or something? You are offering reparation for the sin of whoever those friends were that hurt your little sister. And sometimes, you know, you can be really hurt by somebody, but other people's love It might not take away that wound, but it makes it okay. And it gives you a new perspective. Sometimes it's like you see the other person in that light and you're like, well, I don't know why I even let that person hurt me so much. They weren't worth it, right? Love is a way of healing like that. When somebody shows you Christ's love, then human love that's wounded you doesn't mean as much, right? And so in that way, in the first example there, you know, that brother that saw his little sister hurting, you know, said, I'm sorry that your friends or that, you know, my other brother or, you know, the priest at church or whoever it is was so cruel. Come here. I'll make it up. Right? And that's reparation. Say that, you know, this, a woman has a terrible day and her husband comes home from work and finds her crying over making dinner and throws his arms around her. Suddenly the mean cashier at the store doesn't really matter because his love heals. I would say that reparation is love. It's no more and more, no, no less. You know, when you go to, every time you go to a crucifix and you kiss the wounds of Christ, he sees that. I can't imagine Somebody loving me enough to come and be like, show me your wounds and to kiss them 
to clean them, to actually care about them. Imagine how healing that would be to have somebody who actually loves and wants to heal your wounds. It happens very rarely in the world because people are kind of selfish, right? Imagine that joy that you can give to Christ by coming to him like Veronica on the way of the cross and wiping his face. You can do that in your everyday life by just looking at him with love. Imagine when you're having a hard time and you see somebody who knows you pretty well and they give you a look of love. They might not even know the ordeal that you're going through, but it strengthens you. You're like, wow, somebody loves, right? So we can repair those wounds to Christ. We can be like Simon of Cyrene picking up that cross. We can wash his wounds with our tears the way Our Lady did. Just by kissing a crucifix or during the day remembering his passion and saying, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I'm sorry. You know, when you see somebody sinning terribly, to realize the pain of Jesus over it and to say, Jesus, I'm so sorry, please forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And Jesus might say, but you're bleeding from it. They sinned against you, right? And we're called to be like Christ on the cross and say, no, 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 don't look at it. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. That's reparation. It's love. The Catholic Encyclopedia says we are restored to grace through the merits of Christ's death. And that grace enables us to add our prayers, labors, and trials to those of the Lord and fill up the things that are wanting in the suffering of Christ, like Paul says in Colossians, right? We can thus make some sort of reparation to the justice of God for our own offenses against him. And by virtue of the communion of the saints, the oneness and the solidarity of the mystical body of Christ, we can also make satisfaction and reparation for the sins of others. It's so beautiful. And Jesus revealed so much of this to um, Sister Josefa Mendez, we'll read from here, and St. Faustina and St. Ma Ma Mar Margaret Mary Ella Coke. You know, when we see terrible evil, sometimes we're like, what can we do? What can we do? Like, I can't stop the slaughter of Christians in Pakistan. I can't stop the slaughter of innocent babies in the United States. I can't. We can offer reparation. We can offer rosaries. We can offer fasting. We can offer sighs of love and our own tears to Jesus as a sacrifice. And somehow mystically, mysteriously, he uses those to mend the wounds of the heart of God over sin and to give grace to other people to not sin again. It's very mysterious. You know, when one person sins, you don't, like if I, Mary Klaska sins, I don't only offend the person I sin against and I don't only offend Jesus. I offend all of you because we're one in the body of Christ. Like, imagine you get a terrible infection in your arm. Your whole, because the blood goes through the whole body, your whole body can be filled with an infection and you can have a fever and it's all sick, right? So when one person sins in the church, we're all affected. But when one person is a saint, we're all affected. That's why Satan said about the cure of ours, if there were two or three people like him in the world, I would have no power. That's how powerful his holiness was in that body of Christ. So maybe my neighbor is doing something terrible, but if I am offering penance for them, right? Then I'm making up for their sin. I'm, I'm mending that. And it can give him grace also not to sin again. That's, you know, we're called to pray for those who sin against us first so that we don't have bitterness in our hearts, right? I always go back to... There was a, a cardinal that was kept in a prison. I don't remember if it was in China or somewhere there in the East 
for years and 20 some years. He was tortured all the time. And they asked him what his greatest suffering was. You know, was it being having your fingernails pulled off? Was it being starved? Was it being tortured? And he said, my greatest suffering was not, no, my, my greatest fear. They asked what his greatest fear was. Was it fear of death? Was it fear of the next torture? He said, my greatest fear was of losing compassion for those who tortured me. And I can relate to that because, you know, when people are mean to me, my first response is, I have to be compassionate and loving. I cannot be bitter. I cannot be bitter. Lord, take these thoughts from me. I cannot be bitter. I have to forgive no matter what they've done. That's the measure I measure myself against. And that's the measure that Christ wants us to measure ourselves against. We are called to not become bitter, to not lose compassion, to love. But then also to pray for them, you know, not only for ourselves so our hearts are good and soft and holy, but so that they have the grace to repent. The more people sin against you, the more you're called to love and extend that, for, that hand of forgiveness and prayers and masses and fasting for their conversion, for healing of their wound against you. That's reparation, right? That's reparation. St. Paul said, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. In my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ on behalf of his body, which is the church. What does that mean? Well, St. Thomas Aquinas taught on it. And St. Thomas said, I complete, that is, I add my own amount. And I do this in my flesh. That is, it is I myself who am suffering. I am offering the sliver in my foot for this person persecuting me, right? Or we could say that Paul was completing the sufferings that were lacking in his own flesh, for what was lacking was that just as Christ had suffered in his own body, so he should also suffer in Paul, his member, and in similar ways in others. It's no longer I who suffer, but Christ who suffers in me. It's a beautiful union we can have with him there. And Paul does this for the sake of his body, which is the church, which was to be redeemed by Christ. St. John Chrysostom also talks about that in one of his homilies. He says that St. Paul is offering him his suffering, and that is a demonstration of how deeply in love St. Paul is. When you love someone, you want to be with them. And the more they suffer, the more you want to be with them in that suffering. I remember somebody doing something wrong. It was objectionably, I don't know if you would call it a sin or if you would call it um, a mistake. Because sometimes addictions make things different. But they were in trouble. Most people would be mad. And my heart was broken for them. And they had been taken away somewhere for a little bit. And... I couldn't help them. And I remember driving to where they were and just sitting outside. And, you know, most people would be bitter and just weeping and wanting to be there, wanting to take that suffering. Why? Because I loved. Because I loved. Even more so with Christ who is innocent, Christ who already gave everything for us. We should want to be with him everywhere, especially in his suffering, right? And it is that special love of God. Only divine love wants to suffer for someone. Humanly, we don't like it, right? So we're not going to want to suffer for someone. But when divine love, the Holy Spirit, Christ's love, agape, enters into our hearts, we want to suffer for the other person. Think about when it's, say, say, take a family example. Say it's, you know, your wife's birthday. And you have to make a ton of sacrifices to have, like, the perfect gift for her. 
You almost find joy in all of that sacrifice more than if, you know, you know, you have to work extra hours to earn the money to go buy it. You know, you have to stay up late at night to write something. You have to, whatever it is. But that suffering makes that gift worth more than if you were a rich man that just went in and said, here's a thousand dollars for, you know, a diamond for my wife. Sometimes suffering for somebody, you know, makes it worth that much more. To say, I want to take on suffering for you. That's pure love. That's real love. And just as Jesus offered his sufferings for our sake, we, out of love of Christ and united to Christ, should offer our sufferings for other people's sake. It's really beautiful. And that's from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Okay. And then we come to, I'm sorry, I hear I have this, boom, the catechism, right? So we talk about reparation, and the reason that our reparation is important is because Jesus first repaired. So in the catechism, 411, it says, the Christian tradition sees The announcement of the new Adam, Jesus is that new Adam, who because he became obedient unto death, even death on a cross, makes amends super abundantly for the disobedience of Adam. So that's Christ's reparation for Adam's sin and all of ours. Many fathers and doctors of the church have seen the woman announced in the Proto-Evangelium as Mary, the mother of Christ, the new Eve. Mary benefited first of all and uniquely from Christ's victory over sin. She was preserved from all stain of original sin and by a special grace of God committed no sin of any kind during her whole earthly life. Christ suffered to make up for Adam's sin. And the first recipient of that was Our Lady. And she was sinless. And then she suffered. We see her here as Our Lady of Sorrows. She then suffered with him, with that innocence. She was the first one to make up reparation for her daughters and sons as well. It's really beautiful. So Jesus is our great example in that. Then secondly, in 6.15... Jesus substitutes his obedience for our disobedience. That's what I just explained. It says it again. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. By his obedience unto death, Jesus accomplished the substitution of the suffering servant who makes himself an offering for sin. When he bore the sin of many, and who shall make many to be accounted righteous, for he shall bear their iniquities. Jesus atoned for our faults and made satisfaction for our sins to the Father. Jesus was the first to live reparation, right? And especially on the cross, Jesus was obedient and did the Father's will his whole life. Right? You know, even see like in the finding in the temple, he said, don't I have to be about my father's business? And he said, thy will be done. Father, your will be done. The father and I are one during his whole public life. But it was ultimately in that excruciating suffering of giving his life completely on the cross that he lived the fullness of redemption and the fullness of reparation. We partake in that through baptism and through the forgiveness of our sins, like in reconciliation, right? When the priest prays over us, it's like the blood of Christ. Jesus' sufferings, concrete sufferings that take away our sin. His red blood makes our hearts white. And yet, we are pulled into that in every Mass. In the Mass, Jesus says, this is my body. 
This is my blood, which has been given up for you. That's reparation. I gave my body and blood to the Father in obedience unto death on a cross for you. And in the Mass, we're not only pulled into that mystery to receive it from Christ, but to partake in it. On the altar, as the priest is preparing the bread and the wine, we're supposed to put our hearts all the sacrifices that we've made that day, all of the prayers, all of our wounds, all of our worries, all of our needs, go on that altar. And then Christ swoops them up with the bread and the wine and turns them into his body and blood because we're part of his body, the church, right? And our sufferings and our gift becomes efficacious. It's effective because it's made one with him in the mass and he offers my little inconveniences my little sufferings of heart because you know my sister was rude or my you know neighbor didn't put away his smelly trash whatever it is right my little things become efficacious for the salvation of other people's souls because I united them to Christ in the mass on the altar, on the cross. The catechism says as sacrifice, the Eucharist is also offered in reparation for the sins of the living and the dead and to obtain spiritual or temporal benefits from God. If you need something, have a mass offered. People will say, you know, I've prayed about this for years. Have masses offered. I've had hundreds of masses offered for intentions that I haven't seen the result of yet. But I believe they're efficacious and they will save that soul or those souls, even if it's on their deathbed. They will finally see through the light of Christ how to live mercy and goodness. And the Eucharist is offered in reparation for the sins of the dead. Did somebody you love die? Did they die without the sacraments? Are you worried? Somebody contacted me recently about a suicide and the man wasn't even Catholic and it just seemed so hopeless. And I said, God's outside of time. Go get 10 masses said for his soul. And God will take that grace now and give it to him that moment he was dying. So that he would reach out that hand and he'll grab it and he'll be pulled into heaven instead of falling into hell. The mass is the ultimate reparation. So anything that we do as an act of reparation in our life or an act of penance, an extra prayer, a sigh of love, a fast, whatever we do for reparation, we have to unite it with the mass which is uniting it to Jesus on Calvary. And I want to just speak briefly here that all of this isn't just mystical. We have also the catechism very specifically talks about reparation from sin, okay? And it says that many sins wrong our neighbor and one must do what is possible in order to repair the harm. This is in the catechism. Return stolen goods, restore the reputation of someone slandered, pay compensation for injuries. Simple justice requires as much. So the Lord says we have a duty to make up. If you lied or you gave false information, even if later you're like, well, I didn't know. Go back. Fix that wrong you've done to that person. You have an obligation to say, you know what? Maybe I was prideful. Maybe I was being a jerk, right? That's what simple justice just calls for. And again, the catechism in 2487, let's see here. Oh, 24, we'll do that one first. 54. Wait, let's see here. Do, 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 do. 
I think I marked the wrong, oh, I marked the wrong thing. Okay. In 2487, it says, every offense committed against justice and truth entails the duty of reparation, even if its author has been forgiven. So I can totally forgive you about telling people bad things about me, right? But when it's impossible to publicly make reparation for a wrong, you can't like get on TV and say, you know what, this wasn't really true. It must be made secretly. You must, in normal conversation, say, you know what? That might not have been true. If someone who has suffered harm cannot be directly compensated, he must be given moral satisfaction in the name of charity. This duty of reparation also concerns offenses against another's reputation. This reparation, moral and sometimes material, must be evaluated in terms of the extent of the damage inflicted. It obliges in conscience. That's huge. You know, and it might be something that you said about somebody, or it might just be not defending the truth, not standing up for what you knew was right in a situation. What can you do now to go back and to fix that? You gotta pray about that because it's important Let's see here, 2487, 2412. I think that's just, again, stating, in virtue of commutative justice, reparation for injustice committed requires the restitution of stolen goods to their owner. So like with Jesus and Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus said, I have, if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I'll restore it fourfold, right? So it just goes on and it explains very clearly how those who directly or indirectly have taken possession of the goods of another are obliged to make restitution of them or return the equivalent in kind or in money. If the goods have disappeared as well as the profit and it just kind of explains what you're supposed to do in that situation if you stole from someone, right? And again, it says, every manner of taking and using another's property unjustly is contrary to the seventh commandment. The injustice committed requires reparation. Communitative justice requires the restitution of stolen goods. So if you've ever taken something from someone, right? Or shared something that you shouldn't have, that was private, or you, you know, that all needs to be made up, right? That wasn't yours to take and to share. And then 2509 says an offense committed against the truth also requires reparation. Okay, so if you, I read that already, if you've lied about someone or you've slandered them or you've, you know, spread a misunderstanding about them, you have a moral obligation before God to repair that, right? You can't just say, well, I was too scared to defend you. Well, gather up your courage and go do what's right, right? You can't, I mean, you, you have to be willing to make up for the wrongs you've done to other people. That's just in the catechism. I actually didn't realize till two nights ago that it was that clear in the catechism. I thought, wow, that's pretty clear, right? So we take part in reparation in two ways. One, through this, making up stolen goods, restoring someone's rep rep um, reputation, um, you know, you have to be careful. Don't talk about things you don't know about, right? Um, cause that's how sometimes gossip is spread. That's not true. And concrete ways of making, you know, you, you punch someone down, reach out your hand, help them up, get them going again, you know, make sure that, that you're making up for the wrongs you've committed against others, but then also partaking in the suffering of Christ. And that's something that you do for other people that you've hurt and people who have hurt you, and then just people in the church. So every day at every mass, I always pray for everyone who's ever hurt me and everyone who's ever helped me. 
And then for everyone I've ever hurt and everyone I've ever helped. That's a really a beautiful way to kind of cover it all, if you can't remember particularly. Now I want to speak about a few saints who um, were called to this in a more intense way. The first is St. Therese of Lisieux. And she had a beautiful prayer of reparation that she prayed. And um, it was to make up for the sins against Jesus, right? It's, you know, coming to him and saying, you've got wounds on your face and I love you. I want to make up for what they did to you. I want to make up for what I've done to you. Because love is not satisfied with just like forgiveness. If you love someone, you want everything to be okay and healed. You know, um, and I think that's natural in people. You, you don't want to just like go on in life with like a broken, false relationship. You know, you want it truly healed in true love, Christ-like love. And we want to have that with Christ, and then we want to have it with each other. And we want each other to have it with Christ. We can do that by just offering prayers of love to the wounds of Christ. So here is a prayer of reparation of St. Therese. I adore and I praise thee, O my divine Jesus, Son of the living God. And I desire to make satisfaction for all the outrages which I, the most miserable of thy creatures, have offered thee in all the members of thy blessed body, and particularly in thy holy and adorable face. Hail, worshipful face, disfigured by spittle, hardly to be recognized through the cruel treatment which thou didst receive from the impious Jews. I salute thee, O blessed eyes, all bathed in tears, which thou didst shed for our salvation. I salute thee, O blessed ears, assailed by blasphemies, insult, and cruel mockery. I salute thee, O blessed mouth, filled with graces and tenderness for poor sinners, but embittered with vinegar and gall by the monstrous ingratitude of that people whom thou didst choose from among all the nations. In reparation for all these enigmities, I offer thee all the homage which is given thee in that holy place where thou art pleased to be honored with a special worship, uniting myself therewithin. At the sight of thy most holy face, dear Jesus, so disfigured by bruises, I cry out with St. Augustine, Lord Jesus, impress upon my heart thy sacred wounds, that I may read therein at once thy sorrow and thy love, thy sorrow in order to suffer every affliction for thee. O sorrowful Jesus, when casting ourselves before thy adorable face to ask thee for the graces of which we have need, we ask thee above all to order the interior features of our souls that we may never refuse thee and all that thou thyself desirest of us through thy holy commandments. Praise be to thee, O Jesus Christ, for the most sacred grief of thy adorable face. By this sacred grief and by thy most sacred passion, Pardon all the sins I've committed against thee in thought, in word, in deed, and all the negligence in thy service, all sensuality for which I have been to blame, whether asleep or awake. Grant that I may be able to recall with devotion thy most pitiful pains suffered in thy sacred face, Grant me the grace to mortify my body and so to offer a pledge of my gratitude to thee who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. So in love, you can offer a prayer like Therese did. A, recognizing the suffering of Christ, 
having compassion on him and love, offering that for the forgiveness of your own sins and the sins of others, that's reparation. In Fatima, Our Lady asked Lucia and Francesco and Jacinta to pray prayers of reparation and to do sacrifices. What did she say? Penance, penance, penance for the sins of the world. And she's taught those three prayers of reparation that are so important for us to pray every day. The one we pray after every decade of the rosary. Oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins. Save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven. Help especially those who are most in need of thy mercy. And then another prayer of reparation. My God, I believe, I adore, I trust, and I love thee. I beg pardon for all of those who do not believe, do not adore, do not trust, and do not love thee. That's reparation, right? I offer you my, my love and my adoration to make up for those who don't do that. And then another prayer, O Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I adore thee profoundly. I offer thee the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, present in all the tabernacles of the world, in reparation for the outrages, sacrileges, and indifferences by which he is offended. By the infinite merits of the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary, I beg the conversion of poor sinners. O most holy Trinity, I adore thee, my God. My God, I love thee in the most blessed sacrament. O Jesus, it's for love of thee and reparation for the offenses committed against the immaculate heart of Mary and for the conversion of poor sinners. So in prayers like this, you can make up for the damage that you've done through your own sin to other people. And then you can make up the damage that somebody else has done. You know, you might be really embarrassed that somebody in your family did something. You can make up for it, you know, by your prayers for those people they've hurt. It's very beautiful. St. Margaret Ma Mary Alacoque was called to this um, reparation and she was given the devotion to the Sacred Heart and asked to spread that so that people would love the Sacred Heart to make up for the offenses against the Sacred Heart, right? Once Jesus showed his Sacred Heart to her and said, Behold the heart that has so loved men and that has spared nothing even to exhausting and consuming itself in order to testify to them its love. But in return, I receive from the greater part of mankind only ingratitude by reason of the contempt, irreverence, sacrilege, and coldness shown to me in the sacrament of love. So just by going to Jesus on the cross and in the Eucharist and being grateful, by loving him, by adoring him, we can make up for the sacrilege and the wounds that are inflicted on him by others, right? St. Pius XI said about this work of reparation, endeavor to expiate our own faults and those of others. Repair the honor of Christ promote the eternal salvation of souls. We're all called to offer ourselves as victims of love to shield the sacred heart from the sins committed against him at every moment. Love is reparation and reparation is love, you know? When you're with somebody who really loves you, it doesn't really matter if somebody else says something. So say you're in a room and there's a whole big group of people and one person there actually really loves you. And other people start jabbing at you and being sarcastic and saying mean things. That one person can look at you with love and kind of encourage you. And 
their love is so great you no longer even care about what other people are saying. That's kind of what we're called to do for Jesus, to love him so much that it shields his heart from all of that evil that comes from other people, right? Love is reparation and reparation is love. And on an occasion, Jesus manifested his sacred heart to Margaret Mary Alacoque, right? Like we were just speaking. And he said that his heart was like a tree. She wrote, our savior represented devotion to his sacred heart in the form of a beautiful tree whose fruit he wished to distribute abundantly to all those who had wished to eat of it. And by this means, he purposes to ruin the empire of Satan and to establish the kingdom of his love in the hearts of men. This tree represented the cross and in the center is the fruit, the wounded heart of Jesus, from which flows blood and water, symbols of the sacramental life of the church and all graces. Surrounding the heart are 12 stars, symbolizing the 12 choirs of heaven that give so much glory to him. Jesus told St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, I wish to form around my heart a crown of 12 stars composed of my dearest and most faithful servants. Don't you want to be one of the stars closest to the wounded heart of Jesus, loving him and defending him from the sins of others? In the background can be seen St. Francis of Assisi. Our Lord told Margaret Mary Alacoque that after his blessed mother, St. Francis of Assisi most closely imitated his sacred heart. St. Margaret Mary beheld St. Francis in great brilliance and wrote, After I had seen all of this, the divine bridegroom, as a token of his love, gave me St. Francis as my soul's guide. He was to lead me through all the pain and suffering that awaited me. So St. Francis of Assisi is a guardian of the souls of reparation. He's very close to those who want to give their life in reparation. From this vision of, to St. Margaret Mary, the image of the tree of reparation came to be. And that whole idea of the sacred heart being the tree of reparation, right? And how we're supposed to draw close and be that shield. The soul is supposed to be a shield to the sacred heart from the onslaught of piercing arrows of sin, right? So beautiful. St. Augustine said... Trials and tribulations offer us a chance to make rep reparation for our past faults and sins. On such occasions, the Lord comes to us like a physician to heal the wounds left by our sins. Tribulation is the divine medic medicine. So no matter what happens to you in life, anytime you, you confront tribulation, offer it in union with Jesus on the cross in reparation for whatever he wants. And then he can use it to do the greatest work to save the greatest number of souls. We should often pray prayers of reparation. Here's another prayer that we could pray. O sacred heart of Jesus, animated with a desire to repair the outrages unceasingly offered to thee. We prostrate before thy throne of mercy, and in the name of all mankind, we pledge our love and our fidelity to thee. The more thy mysteries are blasphemed, the more firmly we shall believe in them, O sacred heart of Jesus. The more impiety endeavors to extinguish our hope of immorality, immortality, the more we shall trust in thy heart, sole hope of mankind. The more hearts resist thy divine attractions, the more we shall love thee, O infinitely amiable heart of Jesus. The more unbelief attacks thy divinity, 
the more humbly and profoundly we shall adore it, O divine heart of Jesus. The more the holy laws are transgressed and ignored, the more we shall delight to observe them, O most holy heart of Jesus. See, the more evil is done, the more we want to make up for it. The more thy sacraments are despised and abandoned, the more frequently we shall receive them with love and reverence, O most generous heart of Jesus. The more the imitation of thy virtues is neglected and forgotten, the more we shall endeavor to practice them, O heart, model of every virtue. The more the devil labors to destroy souls, the more we shall be inflamed with desire to save them. O heart of Jesus, zealous lover of souls. The more sin and impurity destroy the image of God in man, the more we shall try by purity of life to be a living temple of the Holy Spirit. O heart of Jesus. The more thy holy church is despised, the more we shall endeavor to be her faithful children. O sweet heart of Jesus. The more thy vicar on earth is persecuted, the more will we honor him as the infallible head of thy holy church, showing our fidelity and praying for him. O kingly heart of Jesus. O sacred heart, through thy powerful grace, may we become thy apostles in the midst of a corrupted world and be thy crown in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Do you see? So to the more evil is done, the more I'm offering my life, my sacrifice, my prayer, my love to make up for it. That is reparation. Jesus talk, spoke often to St. Faustina about reparation. And in paragraph 823, she talks about one day when she suffered in particular in reparation for the sins of priests. She said, I have offered this day for priests. I have suffered more today than ever before, both interiorly and exteriorly. I did not know it was possible to suffer so much in one day. I tried to make a holy hour in the course of which my spirit had a taste of the bitterness of the Garden of Gethsemane. I am fighting alone, supported by his arm, against all the difficulties that face me like unassailable walls. But I trust in the power of his name and I fear nothing. And again, this is from paragraph 474 and 476. She said, I saw an angel, the executor of divine wrath, He was clothed in a dazzling robe, his face gloriously bright, a cloud beneath his feet. From the cloud, bolts of thunder and flashes of lightning were springing into his hands, and from his hand they were going forth, and only then were they striking the earth. When I saw the sign of divine wrath, which is like the anger of God against Satan and sin, which was about to strike the earth, and in particular a certain place for which good reasons I cannot name, I began to implore the angel to hold off for a few moments and the world would do penance. Like Jonah went to the Ninevites, like Moses said, you know, pleaded with the Lord, well, what if you find 10 good people in the city? Will you spare it? That's praying in reparation. It's praying to make up for their sins. But my plea was a mere nothing in the face of the divine anger. Just then I saw the most holy trinity. The greatness of its majesty pierced me deeply, and I did not dare to repeat my entreaties. At that very moment, I felt in my soul the power of Jesus' grace, which dwells in my soul. When I became conscious of this grace, I was instantly snatched up before the throne of God. I found myself pleading with God for the world. That's reparation. With words heard interiorly. 
as I was praying in this manner, I saw the angel's helplessness. He could not carry out the just punishment, which was rightly due for sins. Never before had I prayed with such interior power as I did then. The words with which I entreated God are these. Eternal Father, I offer to you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us. The next morning when I entered the chapel, I heard these words interiorly from Jesus. Every time you enter the chapel, immediately recite the prayer which I taught you yesterday. When I had said the prayer, in my soul I heard these words. This prayer will serve to appease my wrath. That's the chaplet of divine mercy. The chaplet of divine mercy, especially prayed at three o'clock is a powerful prayer of reparation. Later on, St. Faustina said, Today I have heard these words, my daughter, delight of my heart. It is with pleasure that I look into your soul. I bestow many graces only because of you. I also withhold my punishments only because of you. You restrain me and I cannot vindicate the claims of my justice. You bind my hands with your love. We're called to do that, to bind the justice of God by love. Sin has consequences, spiritual consequences. Think about it. If you throw a ball through a window, the neighbor can forgive you, but the window's broke. It needs to be fixed, right? Your prayers and sacrifices of reparation make up for that. You know, for example, a father can say something mean to his daughter and she's hurt. She can forgive him. But that wound needs to be healed and it might only be her husband someday or the priest in the confessional or a friend that she confides in who's able to heal that wound. We're called to do that, right? One more thing from St. Faustina. She said, I came to know of the condition of a certain soul and of what in that soul is displeasing to God. I learned it in the following way. I immediately feel pain in my hands, my feet, and my side, in those places where the hands, feet, and side of the Savior were pierced. At that same time, I received knowledge of the soul's condition and of the nature of the sin that they committed. I experience a desire to make reparation to the Lord Jesus in a way which corresponds to the offense. Today I wore a chain belt for seven hours in order to obtain the grace of repentance for that soul. In the seventh hour I felt relief as the soul experienced interiorly the remission of its sin, although it had not yet gone to confession. For sins of the flesh, I mortify the body and fast to the degree that I'm permitted. For sins of pride, I pray with my forehead touching the floor. For sins of hatred, I pray and do some good deed for a person whom I find difficult. And thus I make amends according to the nature of the sin of which I am aware. And you and I can do the same thing. If you're aware of somebody's sin of jealousy, offer some sacrifice every day until their sin is no longer jealous, right? When I was a nanny in Chicago a few years ago, I worked 80 hours a week. So I worked from 10 p.m. until 11 a.m. and I had triplet newborns. So I would just pray all night and everything I did, you know, one, two, three, and I'd feed them and I'd change them and I'd go to the next one and the next one and have a little bit of time for prayer and then we'd start over. It's just, you know, it's perpetual work, but very contemplative. And I brought with me a beautiful prayer of doing a holy hour of reparation, of adoration, night adoration and night reparation that you can do from your home. 
you know, you should spend at least an hour in adoration a week if you're a lay person, if you're a priest or religious, a day. You should try to stop by the tabernacle as much as possible. But if it's not possible, you can turn your heart to the Eucharist from wherever you are at home. And to say, you know what, on Friday evenings from 10 to 11, I'm going to turn off that TV. I'm going to put away the trashy novel. And I'm going to pray in reparation. And it was such a beautiful prayer. I'm sure you can find the night hours of, re of adoration and of reparation. You can find those books on Amazon. But I myself wrote out from 10 p.m. till 11 a.m. the sufferings Christ would have been going through. You know, at 10 p.m. he was praying in the, you know, garden. And at 11 o'clock he went and found his disciples sleeping. And at midnight he was sweating blood. And at, you know, 1 in the morning Judas came and betrayed him. And at 2 in the morning he was, you know, taken in the Kidron Valley. At 3 in the morning he was put in prison. At 4 in the morning Peter denied him. And I would try to just remember at those hours what was happening. Well, the other day when I was looking up, some prayers of reparation for this podcast, I found a holy hour of reparation and these sisters made up a similar thing. And she, they start at 5 p.m. and it goes all the way for 24 hours. The sufferings of Christ that you can follow. It's really very beautiful. And it would be a beautiful way to, you know, remember, you know, at 10 in the morning, what was happening to Christ and his passion? You could print it out and put it on your fridge and just look at it sporadically, right? Most people can't do it 24 hours a day, seven hours, seven days a week. But to, to keep your, your heart attuned to that and to do prayers of reparation, right? Or whatever hour you can do, think about the sufferings Christ would have been going through at that time, right? Oops. And one more thing I wanted to add was Sister Josefa Mendez was another victim soul. And she's a beautiful book, The Way of Divine Love. But she was given a whole vocation of reparation. Jesus said to her, if you love me, Joseph, Josepha, remove this thorn. And this thorn was the thorn of somebody really sinful that was piercing Jesus's heart, right? He asked her to share in his redemptive work for souls. He reminded her of her vocation as a victim. And a few days after her clothing, on Thursday, the 5th of August, 1920, he made her share once more in the pain of the six thorns that were wounding him. And to comfort her, he said these words, If you are faithful, you shall know the riches of my heart. You will carry my cross indeed, but as on a well-beloved bride shall my benefits be heaped upon you. And, G and Josepha saw this vision of him and it's such a great desire to comfort him. She said, I offered him all the actions of my day. That's an act of reparation. I begged him to tell me if there was anything else I could do. I promised not to let him out of my thoughts for a single instant. I never stopped telling him of my love. That evening before going to adoration, I went to the oratory to ask our blessed lady to help me console her son. When I reached the chapel, I suddenly found myself in the presence of Jesus. And he said, what else do I want? But love, look at my heart, Josepha. It alone can make you happy. Rest in it. And then he said, I had six thorns in my heart. You have taken out five. So her prayer and her suffering repaired five wounds to his heart from thorns of people's sins. But he said, only one remains, and that is the one that wounds me the most. Spare no pain to remove it. And she said, well, what am I to do? And he said, I want you to love me, to be faithful. Remember, no one else can make you happy. I will lay open to you the riches of my heart. Love me without measure. And then later... 
She again remembered the thorn deeply embedded on the sacred heart. And our, she went to Our Lady because she didn't know how to make up. And she said, I begged Our Lady to take charge of that soul to draw out the thorn that Jesus had asked me to remove from his heart. And the next day toward three in the afternoon while I was sewing, so you can do this in your normal duties, I was telling our Lord that I wanted every stitch to be an act of love so as to comfort him. Hardly had I finished the words and I saw him standing there. And he said, I have not come to comfort you, Josepha, but to let you share in my suffering. Can you not see how that thorn pierces my heart? Draw it out. That soul is almost forcing my justice to act. The salvation of this particular soul was to cost Josepha a great deal of suffering. Our Lord was initiating her into his redemptive work, into reparation, which later was to occupy a great part of her life. Jesus said, the sins of mankind wound me deeply, but not nearly so much as those of my religious. That thorn is a religious on whom I have bestowed many talents. She appropriates them and her pride will be her ruin. That evening I saw his heart all on fire, the wound gaping wide and still that thorn was there. He said, I have two measures for every soul. One is of mercy and already it is overflowed and the other is of justice and it's nearly full. Nothing grieves me more than the obstance, obst obstinacy and resistance of this soul. I will make a last appeal to her heart, but if she still resists, I will lead her to her own devices. I don't know what he did to make me understand, but I would have given my life to save that soul. So she was being called and in, what did Jesus say? Do not look at the sins of that soul, but at the blood that thou hast shed for it. Oh, that's what she said to Jesus. Don't look at their sin. Look at your suffering over it. Look at your blood that can cleanse the whole world. At the end of the holy hour, Jesus came. His heart was still pierced by that thorn. I implored him to have mercy on that soul. So obstinate in sin. Sometimes even religious are so hard in one area. They don't accept the mercy of God. Jesus didn't answer. And I said, but Lord, won't you forgive her? And he said, I will touch her heart once again. But if she responds, and if she responds, she will be the beloved of my heart. But if she holds out, if she keeps pride, my justice must act. Josepha's offerings were more and more for many days. Her soul was plunged in unspeakable sadness. I think that never before have I understood, as I do now, what is meant by resistance to grace. I seem to endure something of the grief of the heart of Jesus when a soul turns away from him. You know, even people who seem good and holy, the Lord can be pouring out this grace and they just resist. But our Lord finally said to her, if you are ready to suffer, I will wait for that soul. But unless she herself wills to be forgiven, I cannot pardon her. She has to use her free will. A few days later, Jesus said, when I find a soul that is loving and wants to comfort me, I am ready to grant whatever she wants. So I will wait and knock again at the door of her heart. If she is willing, my heart is ready to forgive. His words left me in agony. He has taught me to repeat often, my God, I will suffer for love of thee and to comfort thy sacred heart. This is all an act of reparation, right?
At the end, he says, I want you to offer me everything, even the smallest things to comfort my heart's suffering, especially those I have to endure from consecrated souls and religion. I want you to rest in my heart without any fear, gaze on it. Cannot this flame burn up all your imperfections? Leave yourself entirely in my hands and be busy only in pleasing me. So it's just an example of how God can call a soul into reparation for another soul. And it's really painful when they resist grace, but Sister Josepha kept pleading. She went on and on and on. There have been different prayers given to different mystics over the years of reparation. Another one here at the end I wanted to mention was a prayer given to Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre. She lived from 1816 to 1848. She was a Carmelite. And our Lord revealed his desire for a work of reparation for the sins against the first three commandments, especially in reparation for blasphemy and the profanation of Sunday and the holy days of obligation. There's a beautiful prayer that she wrote to make up for blasphemy. How often do people say, oh my God, or Jesus' name in a, in a way that's not holy? It's a deep wound to his heart. And there's a prayer that she wrote, or it was dictated by God, by Jesus to her. May the most holy, most sacred, most adorable, most mysterious and unutterable name of God be praised, blessed, loved, adored, and glorified in heaven, on earth, and in hell by all of God's creatures and by the sacred heart of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, in the most holy sacrament of the altar. I used to know a version of that by heart, and every time I heard someone say, oh my God, or Jesus' name, I would say, you know, may the most holy, and I don't remember it now, unutterable name of God be praised, adored, and glorified. But to move your heart to make up for that sin when it's done in your presence. And here at the end, I want to end with this litany of the holy face that was composed by Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre. And it was composed in reparation. And so we pray this prayer to the suffering face of Jesus in reparation for our sins and the sins of the world. And I just encourage you in this little bit of Lent that's left to add acts and prayers of reparation for your own sin for the sins of those you love, for the sins of those who sinned against you, and for the sins of the world that the Lord needs. Lord of mercy on us, Christ of mercy on us, Lord of mercy on us. Christ hear us, Christ graciously hear us. Holy Virgin Mary, pray for us. O adorable face, which was adored with profound respect by Mary and Joseph when they saw thee for the first time, have mercy on us. O adorable face, which in the stable of Bethlehem did ravish with joy the angels, the shepherds, and the magi, have mercy on us. O adorable face, which in the temple did transpierce with a dart of love the saintly old man Simeon and the prophetess Anna, have mercy on us. O adorable face, which was bathed in tears in thy holy infancy, have mercy on us. O adorable face, which, when thou didst appear in the temple at twelve years of age, didst fill with admiration the doctors of the law, have mercy on us. O adorable face, white with purity and ruddy with charity, have mercy on us. O adorable face, more beautiful than the sun, more lovely than the moon, more brilliant than the stars, have mercy on us. O adorable face, fresher than the roses of spring, have mercy on us. O adorable face, more precious than gold, silver, and diamonds, have mercy on us. O adorable face, whose charms are so ravishing and whose grace is so attractive, have mercy on us. 
O adorable face, whose every feature is characterized by nobility, have mercy on us. O adorable face, contemplated by the angels, have mercy on us. O adorable face, sweet delectation of the saints, have mercy on us. O adorable face, masterpiece of the Holy Ghost, in which the Eternal Father is well pleased, have mercy on us. O adorable face, delight of Mary and Joseph, have mercy on us. O adorable face, ineffable mirror of the divine perfection, have mercy on us. O adorable face, whose beauty is always ancient and always new, have mercy on us. O adorable face, which appeases the wrath of God, have mercy on us. O adorable face, which makes the devils tremble, have mercy on us. O adorable face, treasure of grace and of blessing, have mercy on us. O adorable face, exposed in the desert to the inclemency of the weather, have mercy on us. O adorable face, scorched with the heat of the sun and bathed with sweat in thy journeys, have mercy on us. O adorable face, whose expression is all divine, have mercy on us. O adorable face, whose modesty and sweetness attracted both the just and sinners, have mercy on us. O adorable face, which gave a holy kiss to the little children after having blessed them, have mercy on us. O adorable face, troubled and weeping at the tomb of Lazarus, have mercy on us. O adorable face, brilliant as the sun, radiant with glory on Mount Tabor, have mercy on us. O adorable face, sorrowful at the sight of Jerusalem and shedding tears on that ungrateful city, have mercy on us. O adorable face, bowed to the earth in the garden of olives, covered with confusion for our sins, have mercy on us. O adorable face, bathed in bloody sweat, have mercy on us. O adorable face, kissed by the traitor Judas, have mercy on us. O adorable face, whose sanctity and majesty smote the soldiers with fear and cast them to the ground, have mercy on us. O adorable face, struck by vile servants, shamefully blindfolded and profaned by the sacrilegious hands of thy enemies, have mercy on us. O adorable face, defiled with spittle and bruised by innumerable buffets and blows, have mercy on us. O adorable face, whose divine look wounded the heart of St. Peter with a dart of sorrow and love, have mercy on us. O adorable face, humbled for us at the tribunal of Jerusalem, have mercy on us. O adorable face, which preserved thy serenity when Pilate pronounced the fatal sentence, have mercy on us. O adorable face, covered with sweat and blood, falling in the mire under the heavy weight of the cross, have mercy on us. O adorable face, worthy of our respect, veneration, and worship, have mercy on us. O adorable face, wiped with a veil by a pious woman on the road of Calvary, have mercy on us. O adorable face, raised on the instrument of most shameful punishment, have mercy on us. O adorable face, whose brow was crowned with thorns, have mercy on us. O adorable face, whose eyes were filled with tears of blood, have mercy on us. O adorable face, into whose mouth was poured gall and vinegar, have mercy on us. O adorable face, whose hair and beard were plucked by the executioners, have mercy on us. O adorable face, which was made like that to of a leper, have mercy on us. O adorable face, whose incomparable beauty was obscured under the dreadful cloud of the sins of the world, have mercy on us. O adorable face, covered with the sad shades of death, have mercy on us. O adorable face, washed and anointed by Mary and the holy women, wrapped in a shroud, have mercy on us. O adorable face, enclosed in the sepulcher, have mercy on us. O adorable face, all resplendent with glory and beauty on the day of the resurrection, have mercy on us. O adorable face, all dazzling with light at the moment of thy ascension, have mercy on us. 
O adorable face hidden in the Eucharist, have mercy on us. O adorable face, which will appear at the end of time in the clouds with great power and majesty, have mercy on us. O adorable face, which will cause sinners to tremble, have mercy on us. O adorable face, which will fill the just with joy for all eternity, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, graciously hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us, O Lord. I salute thee, I adore thee, I love thee, O adorable face of Jesus, my beloved, noble seal of the divinity. With all the power of my soul, I apply myself to thee and most humbly pray thee to imprint in us all the features of thy divine likeness. Amen. O God, show us thy face and we will be saved. Arise, O Lord, and let thy enemies be scattered. Let them that hate thee flee from before thy face. Eternal Father, I offer thee the adorable face of the well-beloved Son, for the honor and glory of thy holy name, and for the salvation of all men. Holy Father, keep them in thy name, whom thou hast given me. Eternal Father, look upon the divine heart of Jesus, which I offer thee to receive the wine of thy justice, that it may be changed for us into the wine of mercy. Powerful heart of Mary, refuge of sinners, stay the arrows of divine justice. Eternal Father, I offer thee the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ and all the instruments of his holy passion, that thou may put division in the camp of thy enemies. For as thy beloved Son has said, a kingdom divided against itself shall fall. One can make this offering of the holy face for any intention. For our Lord said, nothing you ask in making this offering of the holy face will be refused to you. So pause for a moment and offer these prayers we just prayed for one intention that's very important to you. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Thank you and God bless you. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.